Thank you for tuning into Stepping Stones of Faith. Stepping Stones of Faith is a ministry of Claytonville United Brethren Church. Our service times are as follows. Sunday morning Sunday school starts at 9.30 a.m. Sunday morning worship starts at 10.30 a.m. If you would like to join us for any of these services, our address is 106 Elizabeth Street, Claytonville, Illinois, 60926. We hope to see you this morning. Good morning. Kayla, it's good to have you here this morning. Thank you for coming. You, you, uh, you, and, uh, you and Kyle can just come here every week if you want. Just, just change the times. Just change the times of the church service. Super early. Super early, 6 o'clock in the morning service time. Shoot down here for 1030. You'll be good to go. All right. Today we're going to continue in our study in the, first, the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. If you're in the Red Bibles, it is page 894. You go to 895 and there's an actual, it's the day, it's the page before that, not the day before that, the page before that. If you're in the Red Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we're going to finish it out today. Chapter 1, we've got quite a bit of reading to do today, but we can, we can work on it. We can get it done. Amen. When we're there, say amen. All right. Page 895, and flip it over to the first page of the 1 Corinthians. Starting in verse 18 today. For to those who are perishing, the preaching of the cross is foolish. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written... I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of his age? Has he not made the wisdom of the world foolish? For since the, in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of preaching to save those who believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, and foolishness to the Greeks. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, we preach Christ as the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For, for observe their calling, brothers, among you, not many wise men according to the flesh, not many mighty men, and not many noble men were called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the, th to confound the things which are mighty. And God has chosen the base things of the world, the things which are despised, yes, and he chose things which did not exist to bring to nothing things that do. So that no flesh should boast in his, in his presence. But because of, of him, you are, you are in Christ Jesus, who made God unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Now, Christ, the power and wisdom of God. It is important to understand that we must remember that when we go through lives, our lives. We've got decisions we have to make. We've got things we're dealing with. Christ is the wisdom and power of God. He is the one who is the answer. He is the one who is the, the solution. Because in him there is wisdom and power. Paul writes, he says, for, those, for to those who are perishing, the preaching of the cross is foolishness. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. A little bit of a contrast. How many of us have friends that are not Christians? All right. Praise God, we need them. Because we need a ministry. We need a, we, we need a mission field. When we talk to those people, 
about Christ, and we should be, in some way we should be talking about Christ to those people, what, are you, what is usually their reaction? I'm sure it's not, I don't want to hear it. Some, maybe it is for some of us. But if your friends are probably kind about it, well, that's your way you believe, and I believe this way. To them, that's the, the cross is foolishness. Why is it foolishness to someone who is perishing? Because they believe in themselves that they can handle it. When we have things that are going on in our lives that are difficult, many people who are not Christians have been raised to pull yourselves up by your bootstraps and move on, keep going, just keep walking, keep pushing. I was raised that way. I was raised that you didn't, you didn't, you didn't even allow a flu to consume you. You kept going. If you were sick, you didn't need to rest. You still went to school. If you were sick, you didn't need to rest. You still went to work. My mom used to say, you feel sick, get up, take a shower, you'll feel better. And she was right in most cases. But understand that that's how people are raised. And therefore, it's foolishness for them to think they need anything outside themselves to help them. To bring them salvation, to bring them anything, to bring them peace. They are, they are their own salvation. They are their own peace. But to us, but to us, it is the power of God. It is the power of God. It is what we lean into, what we lean on. It says, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Now, if we think about this particular passage, we talk about how he's going to take the weak to confound the wise and he's going to use the, the lesser things to, to confound the, the, the better things, in, in my own paraphrase. But if we look at Jesus' ministry, if we look at the ministry of Jesus, he did not hang around the church people. Why? Because they didn't need him, they thought. He hung around those that were lowly in character, that were looked at to be outcasts, the weak. Some people he hung around with, and the majority of them were common folk who weren't even allowed to be in the synagogue. And if they were, they were to sit in the back or in the doorway. They weren't allowed to be in there. So that's where he went. Because those people are the ones that needed him. Or some of them knew that they needed him. But who, who actually crucified him? Who put him on the cross? Who, who, who tried him for, for treason or, or, or not treason? Um, the uh, blasphemy. Who, who actually tried him for blasphemy? The church people. The church people. They didn't need him. So he went to the weak ones. It says, where is, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of his age? Has God not made the wise of this world foolish? That's what he did. That's what Jesus did, didn't he? For since the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know God, and it, it pleased God through the foolishness of preaching to save those who believe. Very interesting statement. For since the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know God. We do not know God in our own wisdom. We do not know God in our own thought patterns. What's, what's, the, what's the scripture say in the Old Testament? Lean not on your own understanding. Lean not on your own understanding. Why? Why? Because our own understanding is flawed. We have our own understandings. We think, well, you know, I, when I was growing up, get up, take a shower, 
If you got the flu, you'll feel better. That's my own understanding. That's not God's understanding. Or things like that sound Christian, we've heard, we've heard things like God helps those who help themselves. Not scripture. Nowhere in scripture does it say that. That's our own understanding. That's our wisdom. It's not God's wisdom. It's not God's wisdom. It's our wisdom. God helps those who help themselves. No, he doesn't. That's pride. That's leaning on our own understanding. God wants us to depend upon him, not to be independent from him. So the world in its own wisdom will perish. So us as individuals today, whatever date this is, 2021, we are in our own wisdom, we will perish. So we call ourselves Christians, we read the Bible and we say, well, this is what it says, but I don't believe that. It says this is wrong, but I don't believe that. Or they might, someone might say, well, when the Bible says that our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, we should look after it. It doesn't say I, ha I can't do this or I can't do that or I can't do this or can't go here. So I don't believe that. That's our own understanding. That's our own wisdom. And we will perish for that. It goes on and it says, he goes on and he says in verse 22, for the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. The Jews required a sign. You look, at, you look at the Old Testament, look at Gideon. Gideon's a great example of a Jewish person who required a sign. If it's really you, Lord, make the ground dry and the fleece wet. So God did it. Okay, you did it, but if it's really you, Lord, then make the fleece dry and the ground wet. So he did that, and he did a couple other things too. He required a sign. If we look at the, the, the story of the, New, the, of, of the New Testament, the ones that crucified Jesus were looking for a sign that they thought in their own wisdom should be produced. But Jesus was right in front of them telling them that I am the way, I am the truth, I am life, I am the one, I am the, I am the Messiah. There are Orthodox Jewish people today who are still looking for a sign. Still looking for a sign. Are we looking for a sign today? God, if it's really you, do this. And if God wants us to believe, he'll do it. That's what he, why he did that for Gideon. He wanted Gideon to understand that he was God. He was the... He was he was the one true God. And if God is drawing you, God will give you a sign. But are we looking for a sign? Or are we believing God? The Greeks search, search after wisdom, seek wisdom. Are we seeking wisdom? How do you get wisdom? What do you do to get wisdom? Well, it's what I say every single week almost, right? You get into your Bible and you read it. And you pray through it. And you talk to God about it. And you, and, you, and, you, and you ask God to touch you. And you ask God to minister to you. That's how, you grant, how you're granted wisdom. We're required as Christians to grow. We're not supposed to be stagnant. Right? You ever go down to a swamp or a body of water that doesn't move? What's it like? What's it look like? What's it smell like? It's nasty, green sometimes, and smells gross, stinks, because there's no life in there. And what, what life there is in there, it is destroying that ecosystem 
because there's no body of water moving. Are we going to be stagnant like a swamp and stinky and gross? Or are we going to be like a stream that is moving? A waterfall where the water's moving. What, what's the difference? The water is clean. You can drink from that water. Because when water is moving, it is beating itself against rocks, going through sand, and getting rid of all the junk that makes a swamp smell. Are we like the waterfall? Where we are being constantly sifted through the sand of the Spirit? We're constantly being beat upon the rock of the Word to beat off all the dross and all the contamination and all the debris? Or are we going to sit still stagnant in, that, in our life? When I think about sitting stagnant, I think about someone who sits in their chair. I have a big green recliner, right? And I like to sit in that recliner. It's comfortable. It goes back. If I cover up in it, I go to sleep. That's how comfortable it is. Well, when I think of a swamp or someone who is stagnant, I think of my, myself or somebody sitting in a chair like that and never doing anything again except for to go two places, and that is to the refrigerator and the bathroom. And you don't do anything. What happens to you and as an individual? You get bigger, right? You, you, you tend to fill out the chair if you're not moving. And you get unhealthy. You start having physical issues and, and, and metabolic issues, right? Same thing spiritually. If we're not moving, we begin to have spiritual issues. Our trust begins to wane. Our desire begins to wane. Our love for the Lord begins to wane. And we begin to love Netflix instead. or Amazon Prime, or whatever the case. And this is not a dig at anybody that watches anything. But understand, we have to have balance. We have to keep moving. He goes on. It says here that, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews. Why? And foolishness to the Greeks. Why? Because the Jews were so ingrained in their traditions, their, their scripture, which they need, we all need to be entrenched in the scripture, but they were, they were entrenched in their own traditions that they couldn't see Christ in front of them. They couldn't see the, the, the prophecy standing in front of them because the traditions got in the way. The traditions got in the way. And it was foolishness to the Greeks. You look at the, the, the Greek empire, the Greece. They were very agile people. They, had, they were, they were the, I believe they were the beginners of the Olympic Games. They, that's how the Olympic Games came from. They were fit. They were healthy. They, were, they didn't need anything else. It was foolishness to them. They seek after wisdom, but the wisdom was not the wisdom of God. It was the wisdom of academia and all the things. I want us to go after the wisdom of God. It says that, it says both of those, both to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, we preach Christ as the power of God and the wisdom of God. If you look at your Bible, we all have a Bible today, right? The words in this text are basically Jesus Christ in paper form. It's the heart of God in paper form. And in this book is wisdom and direction and salvation 
and anything you'll ever need is found here. You're going through life's struggles, whatever that might be. I don't know what it is. You know what it is. And it's between you and God. The answer is in this book. The answer is in this book. And he says, and he goes on and he says that for the foolishness of God is wiser than men. Isn't that interesting? God is not foolish, but if he was, his foolishness would be wiser than our wisdom. Isn't that interesting? If God was foolish, his wisdom would be more than ours. Being foolish. What does that say? That says that God is greater in every way. Whether he was foolish or not, he's still greater than you or I. He's still greater than you or I. Verse 26, For we observe your calling, brothers, among you, not many wise men according to the flesh, not many wise men, and not many noble men were called. So, noble men who had worldly accomplishments, who turned to themselves and not to God, wise men who sought wisdom of the world and not the wisdom of God, they weren't called. The ones who sought the wisdom of God, they were called, and we are called. What are, we, what are we seeking today? What am I seeking? What are you seeking today as the grand scheme of things? A lot of times we, we talk about prayer requests and sometimes the prayer request is, I want guidance and direction. Are we seeking that from God? See, a lot of things that give us guidance and direction can be outward things like, well, you know, should I buy, like, when you buy a car, that's a major life decision for some of us. So when you buy a car, what, what's the wisdom we seek? Oh, is it, the wisdom that, that some people seek is, well, if it's a good deal, if I can get, if I have enough equity in my current car to be able to make the payment lower, then it's a good thing. Well, what about the wisdom of God in that? What about what, what God says? Some people say, well, if it goes through, then it's a sign from God that it's for me. Not necessarily, because it says that the enemy comes as a deceiver and the angel of light. That's why it's important to understand the wisdom of God in every situation. We should seek that. What are we seeking? You know, I have two little kids, and maybe someday Kayla and Kyle will have children. And they're going to have, we, we are teaching our kids and they're going to have to teach their kids at an early age the importance of seeking the wisdom of God. Because my kids and their kids, as well as the kids we all have had, have to make life decisions by the age of 18. Starting at the age of 16, what, it's, what do they do? They say, well, where, where are you going to start, where, where, where are you going to go to college? Are you going to go to college? Where are you going to go? Are you going to go to Christian college? Are you going to go to secular college? Are you going to go to, to trade school? What are you going to do? That takes wisdom from God to know. When I was teaching Sunday school classes to teenagers, 12, 13, 14-year-old kids, this concept of knowing the wisdom of God at that age they should have had it nailed down already, but I would tell them, nail it down now. Because you've got to know the wisdom of God. College is a life change. Marriage is a life change. Buying a home is a life change. Switching jobs is a life change. You've got to know the wisdom of God. And he's saying here that we need to, we need to know that God's wisdom, even though if it was foolish, it's greater than ours. So we need to be seeking that. God is not foolish, but if he was, it'd be wiser than me. Right? So it would stand to reason that we should seek the wisdom of God in every situation. Every situation. 
Verse 26, For we observe your calling, brothers, for you are not, are not many wise men according to the flesh, not many mighty men, not many noble men are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Where did Jesus go? He went to the common folks, tax collectors and sinners. How many times when he told them to keep quiet, did they actually keep quiet? He healed somebody, he said, don't tell anybody. What'd they do? They ran and told everybody. Why? Why did he use them? And, and what, was the, what was the Pharisees and Sadducees' reaction? Oh, wait a minute, it's the Sabbath. You can't heal on the Sabbath. You can't do that. That's against the, the Jewish law. That's against the law of Moses. Well, guess what? Jesus was there at the writing of the law of Moses. So he would choose the foolish things. People that couldn't keep their mouth shut about the things of God. That's why it's so important for us to not keep our mouth shut. Jesus did something in your life, talk about it. God healed Finn. Talk about it. I'm sure Kayla said, well, my, my grandpa's church is praying for him and we are, and they are standing with you in the healing process. Great, fantastic, do that. What I like about our prayer list is that there's a lot of praises every week. There's praises every week. Sometimes there's more praises than requests. Talk about the praises. This is what God is doing in our church. This is what God is doing in my life. Don't keep our mouth shut. The simple things to confound the wise. Can you imagine the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees going, and you know, Jesus would say, go show yourself to the priest. They'd be like, well, the, I'm, you, could you imagine this? this person was covered in leprosy yesterday. They come in today, it's completely healed. Why? What happened? Confounding the wise, using the simple to confound the wise. Imagine that. You're going, to so, you're going somewhere, somebody knows you're going through something, and all of a sudden you're happy, everything's better. What happened, Jesus? Well, wait a minute, what do you mean? Jesus touched my life. Wait a minute, what, what who? Jesus touched me. Jesus healed me. Our son downstairs is a great example of that. We have, or had at the time, an ultrasound proof that my son had a heart defect. He had two arteries going on to one side of his heart and nothing on the other side. And we prayed and we asked God to touch him. And when we, when we sat down in the cardiologist's office and he said, he's one of these kids that's going to need surgery because if... It, and he said, it's a good thing we found it now because he's one of those kids that with the artery wrapped around his heart, when he gets bigger, it's going to close off and he's going to die of a heart attack. 16 years old, those, when they start doing it, that's when it starts happening. We're like, well, we don't want to lose our kid at 16 years old. So we prayed, we asked God, and we had that proof that there was two arteries out of one side and the possibility of him losing his life at the age of 16 or thereabouts. And so we prayed and we asked God to touch his body. I don't know how long it was, a couple months, three months. We had that appointment in January, I think it was. And we went up there and they did an ultrasound on his heart. After three, four months of praying, guess what? One artery out of the left side, one artery out of the right side. All the arteries are going in the right direction, going to the right places. Everything's good. That's the power of God. That's because we sought God through wisdom. We're not going to keep our mouth shut about that. Heck no. God touched our son. I was talking the other day with someone in Walmart. And we know our, you know, we've, we've been praying for Marcy, our friend Marcy, who has cancer, for stage four brain cancer. And we were talking, and this gentleman said, well, he said, we just can't accept that diagnosis. We've seen too much in our church. God has touched too many people in our church and healed them. 
And he brought up our son, and he said, your son, and, and this person, and that person, and things over in India they've seen that God healed. We've seen too much. We can't, we can't accept that diagnosis. Don't keep quiet about what God is doing. He uses the weak things to confound the wise. The people that are not Christians, they say, well, what are they talking about? God doesn't do that anymore. There are, there are, there are denominations that have, they, are called, they have a thing called cessationism, or they are cessationists. You know what that means? They don't believe miracles happen today. They don't believe God allows people to speak in tongues. They don't believe God does things to intervene in, in, his, kids, in his children's lives. They're cessationists. So in their wisdom, something like this makes them go, wait a minute, what? It's a coincidence. It's not really God. Guess what? It is God. So he uses the simple things to confound the wise, right? And it goes on and he says, God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the, th to confound the things which are mighty. So I, I, I always think about, when I read that scripture, I always think about the little guy. You ever see uh, people get into a fight and everybody thinks the big guy is going to win because he's huge and he's got muscles and he's a big guy? And you think, well, he, he's going to just throttle this little guy, little short guy. Guess what happens? A lot of times the little guy wins because he's little, he's faster. He can move faster. He can get places that the big guy can't get. The little things to confound the mighty. God uses the little things to confound the mighty. And what does that mean, mighty? It means people that are, think they're mighty in their mind. They understand science or they understand God was the creator of science. So if somebody says, well, scientifically, there is no cure or there is no, um, there's no basis for a healing here, mentally they're mighty, but God uses the small things to confound the wise to, and to confound the mighty. He goes on. And God has chosen the base things of the world to confound the which are despised. Yes, though, and, and he chose the things which did not exist to bring to nothing the things that do. Jesus, again, went to the things that are despised, the people that are despised. He's hanging around with tax collectors and sinners and prostitutes. What kind of person is he? He's saying all these things. He's blaspheming God. Now, who said that was the scribes and the Pharisees and the religious people. Jesus went to the small things, the unlovely things, the things that they considered not good. Why? Because he believes in us. Did he love the Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes? Yeah, he did. But they didn't choose to follow. We see that when he weeps over Jerusalem. When he said, oh, all I wanted to do was get, gather you like chicks gathers, like, like a mother hen gathers her chicks under, under her wing and bring you to, to a place. He loved them, but they chose not to love him. So that brings a question, doesn't it? Where, who do we love? Do we love God? And what he has, or do we, have, do we love our own way of thinking, our own thoughts, our own desires, our own things, our own wisdom? God says this, but I believe this, so I must be right. No, no, no. Look at it the other way. God says this, that settles it. We used to say, God says this, I believe it, that settles it. Doesn't matter if I believe it or not. God said it, that settles it. He's the ultimate authority. And he chose the things that are weak to confound the wise and the mighty. 
And he went to the thing, went to the people that were, that were despised to confound the, the, the wise. So that no flesh should boast in his presence. He says that he brought things, brought, uh, things that do not exist to bring to nothing things that do. So that no flesh should boast in his presence. We should not boast in our own way. Of, Look what I did, by golly. I, found, I, I figured this out. I'm so smart. I'm such a great guy. Right? No, 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 no. What does it say in James? James says everything that is good comes from above. So if you are boasting on something that you think you did, understand that it didn't come from you. It came from God. And the fact that we're boasting about it would denote that we need to repent. Everything we have is good, that we consider good. Think about the things you, you consider are good in your life right now. Every one of us. Kayla, I'm going to pick on you. Is that okay? The things that are good in your life are your husband, your new home, your grandpa, your mom, your dad, your brother. I'm just naming things that I know are good, but other things too. Those aren't given to you by your own accord and your own thing. Those are given to you by God. So what does that mean? Cherish the good things. You know, we so often... It's because we're human. We fight with people. We fight with the things and we hurt the ones we love the most, right? We should be cherishing those relationships, those people. A lot of us have kids and grandkids. They're good. They're good things in our life. God gave them to us. We should not boast that, boy, I've got some great family members, or boy, boy, I got some great grandkids. I did well by my son or my daughter to raise good kids. No, 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 no. God gave you the ability to have the things you have and to do the things you've done. So that no flesh would boast in his presence. But because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, whom, may, whom God made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Wisdom. Wisdom means we get wisdom from God. Righteousness, we are, we are made right with God. Sanctification, we are set apart unto God. And redemption, we are redeemed to God. All of that through Christ. Number one, we have wisdom if we choose to accept it. We have righteousness if we choose to accept it. Sanctification if we choose to accept it. And redemption if we choose to accept it. None of this is just imputed upon us without our knowledge or without our input. God is a gentleman. He is not going to give us these things unless we accept. Wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. In other words, you can boast, but instead of saying, look what I did, look what the Lord has done. There's a song we used to sing, look what the Lord has done, look what the Lord has done. I'm not going to sing it all because you'll run out the back door because I sing so horrible. But, un but understand that we need to be thinking like that. Look what the Lord has done in our life. 
A great example and a great thing is, like I said, the prayer list. Look at all the things God has done. And there are things in your life that I don't even know about that God has done in your life. God's sending me a text message right now. But there are so many things in your life that God has done that maybe I don't even know about. Focus on those things. Say, look what God has done. Build someone else's faith. Build someone else's faith. You know, we have conversations with our kids about God. Why do we do that? Why do, why do we do that as a family? Why do you do that as couples, as family members? Why do you do that? To build faith. We study the scriptures with our kids. We talk about scripture with kids, what with our kids. Why? To build faith. Look what God has done. Don't boast in ourselves. Boast in Christ. Boast in God. He has done so much. That healing on Zeke's heart had nothing to do with Zeke or me or Amy. I didn't go in there and say, well, I'm going to fix it. And the doctors didn't even go in there and fix it. The ones who knew how to fix it, they didn't fix it. It had nothing to do with an outside source. It was God. So boast in the Lord. Boast in the Lord, amen? Boast in Him. That's going to build your faith and the faith of those around you. It'll build it. If we boast in ourselves, you know what that does? It tears down. It tears down, amen? So let's not tear each other down and tear others down. Let's build each other up and others up. Let's build us up, build, build ourselves up in the Lord. Proclaiming the things God has done. Understanding that it's not our wisdom, it's His. And it's not what we've done, it's what He's done. Amen. Shall we pray? Father, thank You today for Your grace and Your mercy. Thank You for the things You've done in our lives. Bless us and minister to us. And Lord, I pray that You touch and bless each and every one that's here. Give us the ability to look to You for strength and peace and joy and to boast in the things that you've done and not the things that we've done. And Father, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Challenge for this week. I almost forgot, but I didn't. Think about the things that God has done in your life, the good things, and boast in him. Boast in him. Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening to Stepping Stones of Faith. I pray that you find value in this content. You can also find an audio podcast of this program on all the major podcasting platforms. Just type Stepping Stones of Faith into the podcast search bar. Once again, I'm Pastor Josh. Thank you for joining me today.